Welcome to Comic Tropes. Folks, we have a great interview for you today. This is an artist who got an early start working with Jonathan Hickman at Image Comics. He's worked for DC, for Marvel. He's drawn Ninja Turtles. He currently has a crowdfunding project. Folks, Nick Dragata. Nick, how are you? Um, I'm, I'm Nick Patera. You're... You're Nick Patera? <laughs> These questions aren't going to work. Um, all right, folks, I guess we're going to wing it. <laughs> all right, I'm kidding around, of course. Thank you, Nick, for being a good sport there. I'm happy to have you. Um, I have been following your work for a while. You've been in the industry for over 10 years at this point. You've been uh, you've been uh, plugging away at it for quite a while. And you've all, uh, always, uh, on a personal note, you've always like uh, helped promote my channel and, and been very supportive of me. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, regarding your channel, uh, you, there's a lot of YouTube channels out there that, that build an audience in all kinds of different ways. But when I saw your channel show up and the way you're so earnest, the way you put yourself out there, love your intros, the deep research. And I was like, this guy's doing everything right. If this channel doesn't take off, like the comic industry has problems. So watching your channel grow and blossom has been a, a wonderful thing. And, and watching you come into your own, making it and seeing you doing it all on your own now. And uh, I think full time now too, right? Uh, you're doing it all the time. Dude, congrats. Full time. I've still got a part time job too, but I am doing this full time. Yeah. yeah, I saw you were like phasing out, but you'll be, that'll be done soon because you're, <laughs> you're doing incredible work. But I mean, I'm so happy for you and uh, you're a huge asset to the industry and uh, a channel I absolutely go to and share your videos to my buddies with. Uh, I, I love them. Uh, you're absolutely my favorite channel. And when you agreed to have me on when I reached out, because it's so, it's so hard to promote yourself. And I was okay. like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to say, if anyone wants to read it, read it or check it out, I'll send it out. And uh, you said, I'll have you on. And I, that meant the world to me. So I appreciate it, man. I love your channel and uh, it means a lot. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for all the compliments, but I sincerely, uh, I'll take them. Thank you very much. Let's talk about you. That's why we're here. Um, this is all about you. And, um, you know, I thought we'd do things instead of just sort of going completely chronologically and everything. I, I thought it might be fun to start talking about your current project. Um, you've got a crowdfunded book coming up. Um, I've got some questions about that, like why it's crowdfunded. But what, what I'd really like to know, let's set the table for the viewer out there. Tell us a little bit about what Axe Wielder John is your new book tell us tell us what kind of a story that is and and sort of why you're why you want to do this type of story right now um uh Axe Wilder john is my writer artist debut um it's the story of this faceless barbarian who uh falls in love with the heads of his many victims and basically you're going to follow this man around and he's a no-nonsense kind of uh fix the world his way and his way is wielding axes. And there was something about that uh, lesson when he couldn't fix it, fix his problems by chopping them in half anymore that gave him a little care, a story arc. And the idea for Axe Wilder came to me when my daughter got sick and people were telling me, um, hey, give it over to God or trust the doctors. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start doodling this character who takes no, who takes no crap from anyone who's going to fix it his way. But then I, he also kind of got a problem like I had where he couldn't fix it himself. And so that gave John Axwell or John a chance to like, a, like writing wise, it gave me a little obstacle to give him some obstacles to learn from that are bigger than, than his way of handling things. And uh, when I came up with that idea, it meant so much to me that it came to me at a time when I, when I kind of needed a hero. So I was like, I'm going to make this no matter what. So as soon, as soon as I got home, I started writing it. Uh, my daughter got better, which is you know awesome. And then what what happened was we, you know, I just been funding it myself, and I said I'm going to make. It. I'm I'm not going to ask. I, I love all the publishers. I've worked with most publishers. I love Image, and I'll, it'll probably maybe I'll take the soft cover to Image, but I didn't send it to anybody. I said I'm going to make this my way. I hired the team I wanted, uh, you know, top notch creative team, and I'm writing and drawing the book myself. I'm lucky that I have friends like Jonathan Hickman. And other great writers that I can send it to for advice, and, and my wife's a writer, and so it's it's me playing with my action figures again at the most adult, violent, over the top level. And I'm sure you got whiffs of some of that since you since you checked it out. Right? Yeah. No, I appreciate you sending me over like um, a draft version so that I could you know like get a sense of what it was before we talked and everything. Um, I, when I saw it, for the record, 
since it is a crowdfunding project, I'll just mention this as an independent uh, guy, almost complete, like very, very, very close to complete. And that's saying something for, what is it, like 140 pages, something along those lines? Yeah, the main story's 108 pages, and I got 14 pages left. Um, but by the end of the campaign, my the way my schedule's set up, it's going to yeah. be a 40-day campaign. I'll be finished with the line art. Colors, we got about 40 pages in, but we'll be we'll be tag teaming the colors to finish it. But as far as like an oversight, and then we've got a lot of pinups and I've got a little uh, short story by another artist in there, but basically it's, it's going to be not, it's 90%, 85% complete now with 15% to go. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a lot of work and I funded it myself and some of the creative team. I'll give them a shout out. Chris Stevens, who's an Eisner award winner. Um, I really wanted to work with him. So I was like, I'm going to work with the, the editor I want to work with. And I was lucky enough that he was working freelance at the time. Mike Garland, who's colored all of my work at, you know, all the big companies and he's the Manhattan projects colorist. I paid him his rate and he's on board. And then we got Farron Delgado on board. And then I read this book, little bird at image. And I love the design work in it. And it was Ben Dider. And I was like, you know, I'm going to reach out to him too. So I've just been, I just built my super team that I want to make this book. Uh, the way I wanted to make it and something about the way the character came to me. I just didn't feel, it didn't even feel right to like, say to walk up to another person and say, can I make this? I'm like, I just said, I'm going to make this, you know, and uh, I've always wanted to write. I've written short stories before and and some stories before, but I never pitched them. They just sat in, in journals, but I was like, now this one's going to be different. I, I'm going to do this. And forties, you know, I'm on the verge of 40. So I was like, if I can do this before 40, Jack Kirby made all of, you know, the Marvel universe after 40. I was so like 40 is kind of what was my deadline and it's, it's a fast approaching. So, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I do want to follow up on some of that, but I, I will also say uh, I did get something very grounded and personal when I read X wielder, John. So hearing you explain that, you know, where you got the inspiration from makes a hundred percent sense like I, I read that and I was like, oh, there's something of a new father in this main character. It's an over the top, you know, violent barbarian type story, but there was something in the character that like, and that's why I actually ended up liking it was I was like, okay, it's not just over the top violence, which can be fun sometimes, but there was something human at the core of it. So I do appreciate that. But um, what I'd love to follow up on, totally understand your rationale here why you'd like to try to um, crowdfund it as compared to pitching it. You're using a uh, Zoop um, relatively new to the sort of comics crowdfunding game. Why, why go there? What, what made that the, the right choice for this project? Uh, the simple reason for Zoop, uh, I'd been watching them and I, their company concept was everything that I thought was missing in, in a crowdfunding platform. And basically what they do is they, do the customer service, line up the printer, do the fulfillment, all the things you don't want to do as a creator. I don't want to become a distributor. I don't want to become a customer service rep. And honestly, I just would never do that as an artist. It would take me forever and it would pull me away from doing what I love creating. So I'd watch them and watch them. And then they made a big move when they did the uh, artist edition for John Paul Leon, and it was very successful. And I thought that was really, I thought that was a, a really generous thing for them to do that. Uh, without taking a cut. And I thought that was awesome. And people like the, the, the product really brought the people to people wanted that product. And uh, I just think, I just think that like, for me, it's the perfect home and the way in the, and, and then if I knew, I talked to Hickman a little bit and he, he liked it too. And I go to, I go to John with a lot of, when I ask for advice and he said he was going to use them for his uh, Substack uh, hardcovers, which he's mm -hmm. doing. And so like, uh, it made me give me more confidence there too. And, uh, I talked to them and they've just been like, you can't really get, I mean, you could, but you not, most people can get direct contact with Kickstarter and, and say, Hey, I'm going to also, you know, my original art, uh, rep is Felix comic art. And I said, well, can we do a tandem tier with a Felix comic art where he runs that part? And, you know, and, and, you know, we go back and forth and, and bargain things out. And the fact that they're, they can tailor make their platform for, for, specific needs for individual creators was very attractive. And so, you know, that, that to me alone was all I needed to know. And I actually was approached uh, by Kickstarter and this was a tough call. Kickstarter said they would give me their premium spot and that was, that's a great spot, you know? And, uh, but I'd already had conversations with Zoop and I didn't want to. Um, oh, um, your camera just went out, Nick. 
Um, I, we go. I had, oh, sorry about that. Um, I had already had conversations with Zoop, and I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to go against my word. And uh, I spoke. I spoke to the publishing outreach, uh, the head of publishing at Kickstarter, and I spoke to one of their marketing people. And I was like, "Hey, I appreciate the offer. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe sometime soon, but or, or maybe down the line. But right now, I'm going to try it with Zoop." And I knew. I know a lot of professionals are like waiting and seeing to see how it goes, and I've never been a wait and see kind of guy. So yeah. <laughs> Well, good luck. Uh, it, it'll be very interesting to see how this shakes out. Of course, I, I, I'm wishing you success on that. Um, let's get to know you a little bit. We can come back to, to some of this project, but uh, here's a hypothetical. I'm going to put on my Barbara Walters hat. There's a dated reference that my audience won't <laughs> understand. And we'll say, if you weren't doing comic books, who knows why? Maybe it just didn't happen. Maybe your your hands got crushed under a car. I don't know. But if you weren't being, if you weren't a comic book creator, what would Nick Batara be doing? I would absolutely be a construction worker. Yeah, uh, yeah my, my father is an electrician. My brother is an electrician. My other brother's an electrician. My uncle's a plumber. They're all like blue collar uh, laborers. So uh, when I was uh, 16, 17, or even 10 or 11, I would go do side jobs with my dad, and rough out job sites. And uh, I was an apprentice for a summer. And it's what I always assumed I would do. I thought it was a great living. Uh, like you make, you work, you work with your hands. Uh, and uh, he always was able to provide for, for my, my family with it. And so it was almost destiny for me to do that. But what happened was uh, I played football in high school, didn't draw. Uh, I ended up not doing my homework in one of my reading classes or uh, English class. And they had to remove me. They, they gave me because I got, was getting zeros. So they put me in a rem the only class that fed into my schedule was a remedial reading class. And I got, rem so I was like, Oh God, you know, I'm in a remedial reading class now. This ain't good. And, but in that class, there was a kid in high school that drew all the time and he drew so much that he didn't do his work either. And he just so happened to be going to Joe Kubert school. And I was like, I sat next to him and I was like, Oh my God, you can draw on your head. This is like magic. This is a magic trick. You know, like how, how is this possible? So then I started going to the comic book shop with him found the work of Frank quietly there that blew me away. And uh, as he went to the Kubert school, we became really close friends and I would go visit him up in New Jersey. And uh, for in 2003, when he was graduating, I, I just left my parents' house, went up there and lived with him and kind of uh, moonlighted as a Kubert school kid, lived, like, ate his food and uh, you know slept on his sofa and uh, did all the assignments. And uh, so then that kind of got the bug going where I was, I was going to try to do this. And I started, I ended up getting a day job, office job and stuff. And, uh, you know, I would well, say, let me my, just, just interrupt real quick. I, I, are you saying, <laughs> I didn't know about this. You weren't formally enrolled at the Kubert school, but you were no. just doing the same assignments that your yeah, friend yeah. was bringing home. <laughs> Yeah, he, he would bring him home. I was all the way in Houston, so but I would go visit him. But but I would say hey, one of the assignments, hey, let me know what it was like a Batman Predator script. What did you do at the first day of school at the Kubert School? Those kind of scripts. So wow. I would do that stuff. And then when I went up there that third year and stayed, and it was like five guys in a house. I went up there and stayed, and uh, I would do some of their assignments for him, you know, and like because they were all burnt out, you know, three years they got so much work. So I, I started doing some of the stuff for him, and yeah. That was it. Uh, and then I kind of got the bug and I you know, bought a drafting table and how to books and the whole works. And I had, you know, I had to get a day job and, you know, fast food and office job at one point. And what I did was I worked full time, but I would, I stayed in my parents' house and I, you know, and drafting table in my room, lived, slept on a futon for probably five or six years and just kept grinding. And that's how I started getting a reaction to my work, you know, after about 25 or so. You got into drawing seriously pretty late in life, in a way. Like, I didn't realize, like, a lot of artists have always at least been doodling and slowly realized that they can take it more seriously. But you're saying that it was, like, late in high school when you sort of started taking this a little more seriously? Yeah, I would always say, I almost like, uh, I took an art class in the sixth grade or seventh grade, and there was, like, three incredible artists in that class. So I've always been like the fourth or fifth best artist, right? So then in high school, I was like, well, I'm doing that, you know, whatever. And when I saw the, is my buddy's name's Isaac and, I, and that the guy was going to Kubert school and there was, I saw the guy from middle school too. And uh, his name was Chris Bernhardt and Chris Bernhardt was like the best artist. And he was like, no, no, this guy, Isaac, he's the best artist. And I was like, oh my God, I'm around the best artist I've ever seen. 
And so it just kind of like, I've always had a competitive nature, but, uh, and I, I don't think I'm definitely not the most talented, but I do take a lot from my father with the get up every morning at five o'clock when you don't want to get up, work hard. And so it is hard work. I mean, talent will get you a long way, but yeah. talent without work is nothing, you know? So I just like, I always tell myself no one, and I know I'm not the best, you know, but I, I think I'm decent. And so when it was coming to write and draw my own stuff now, I was like, well, I could probably launch a, my own writing career with my art style. You know what I mean? I think that's great. Um, I'm just, I want to dig into this because I didn't expect you to say that you would have gone into like, you know, uh, this construction field. I, 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 because I thought that you got a degree in art education. I did. I did. So I do. I have an art education degree, but it took like 12 years to get. I would, yeah, as I would have my full time. Yeah. So I was doing it on the side and uh, oddly enough. So my friend from the Kubert school didn't get work in comics right away. He came back and got it and started going to community college. By then I had had my associate's degree and I was like, uh, you know, I just kept you know picking away and I, I was just taking the art classes. So I would have something to do. And eventually I was like, I'll take some education classes. So at least I know I can get a job with my degree. I didn't want to not be able to get the job. So it was more like a practical thing, okay. but I, but I, and I enjoy, I give lessons for free to, to kids who are interested, or there's a, there's a kid named Ken who went to the Kubert school and actually won the scholarship, you know, recently. Uh, but he's been coming to me for years and he'll come to my studio and, and draw with me. But I, I, so I love teaching, but I don't, I don't think I would want to teach that. I don't like classroom organization or, um, dealing with uh, higher ups and all that stuff. Mm. It, it was always it was always just a, a means to be able to provide for myself. So when it came when my big break happened with Hickman, you know I got a little work at Marvel with Hickman. He he discovered me in a competition on comic book resources called Comic Book Idol, and yep. then after that he wanted to work with me again. And we did this book called Red Wing, and I got my teaching degree. I had done a free lesson at a at a at a school, and the teachers were blown away and the principal called me back and had me over and basically offered me the teaching job. And it was $60,000 a year. And uh, Hickman came back. And I think my first rate on Red Wing was a hundred dollars a page pencils and inks. And I had to make that decision. What I was going to do. And I picked uh, working on Red Wing. So that, yeah, that's that, like that a third of the salary uh, <laughs> yeah. for people who aren't doing the math too quick, but uh <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Nice. Well, good for you for committing to it. Uh, seems like it is starting to uh, pay off in a bigger and bigger way as you move through your career. Um, let's uh, let's follow up on these contests because you've, you've been uh, finalists in two contests. And I think in a, a lot of ways, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the, that's that's definitely what helped you get your foot in the door. Um, 2006 must have been the wild storm uh, talent search. And it was like late 2007, early 2008, somewhere around there was Comic Book Idol 3. I know you were finalists in both of those, which probably got you in front of a, a number of writers and editors. What I'm curious about, though, is while you were doing those contests, it sounds like you were working as well. So what did you sort of have to sacrifice to, to get the artwork done at that time like what, what what was the process for getting that done while you're living your normal life well the wild storm talent search was easier because they they gave you like a six month notice and it was only three or three pages four pages and that was easier um but the hard part was like committing you had to be at the convention and drop your sample off so you had to you know fly out and so um, I, I entered, there was two, there was one on the East coast and one on the West coast. And I picked the Los Angeles, the wizard world LA at the time. It's not around anymore, but so that one was, I was like, well, how many people are going to show up with pretty good portfolios? Maybe I can do it. And I was a member of the, you remember pencil Jack and digital webbing. Those I was websites. a member of pencil Jack. And uh, yeah. before that, like a uh, wizard world actually. And that's, that's oh, really? honestly how I met like guys like Robert Kirkman and so on, like a lot of amazing talent coming up through, Pencil Jack, digital webbing, et cetera. That 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 was just like a, a huge talent breeding ground in the uh, early two thousands. Yeah, yeah, there was there was an offshoot one called Ten Ton Studios where some of the some they had the you know, Chris Burnham came out of it, Koi Fam, Aaron Cooter, and then I eventually joined up with those guys too. But it was just another version of those. But what I had done was I was trying to I start posting my samples and people had, on the LA one. I hadn't bought my ticket yet, but they're like. 
don't go, <laughs> don't show these sample pages off. And fair enough. I go back and look at them now. They weren't good, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to redraw them and do it better. And I went, I ended up going up there and they, uh, I dropped it off. And they, instead of picking one winner, they picked five winners. And, uh, I got to do a panel with Jim Lee and be on, on stage and all that. And talk about my pages, which was <laughs> incredible. The first time I was mentioned on Comic Book Resources, they said, you know, they spelled my name right and it was in there. I was like, oh, look, I'm on Comic Book Resources because someone covered the panel. So I was super <laughs> cool. But then uh, we had to go back home because they picked five of us. They didn't want to let us down in front of everybody. Um, and we had to compete against each other. And here I thought like, okay, next stage, next stage. But it's very much like a sideshow for them, you know, like it took them six months to get back. I was all revved up and then I ended up not winning. A um, couple of years later, I think 2008, Comic Book Idol. And I was gradually, I would do things like this where I was getting some attention for the work I was putting in. And uh, Com Comic Book Idol 3, I think it had over 200 entries. And you could see the entries when people sent them in. So I, I put my pages up to be a contestant. And I thought I had a chance just because my stuff is idiosyncratic and a little different than most of the average persons at the time. So I was like, you know, I got a chance. I got a chance. And then sure enough, I got picked as a contestant. And then in that competition, the way it was structured was you had to do three or four pages in a week. And All I right. was working full time at the time. And now to answer your question, man, I had to take vacation time. Oh. I had to get people to cover my, I had to get people to cover my stuff. I had to pull all nighters. I, I, I was terrible for about 50, the first 10 years of my career um, not sleeping. So like I would not, I've, I've, I say I would slept only six days of seven days a week uh, for my whole, for my, for the first 10 years of my career. But then it was like two or three days a week and where and it, my all nighters aren't like staying up to 4am and crashing. I stay until the sun comes up, goes back down, sun comes up, goes back down, like a man's all nighter. You know what I mean? And so it's terrible, terrible for you. Maybe and you so, can do that when you're young. <laughs> I think as you get older, it, like your body just does not cooperate. No, no, it doesn't. Sleep, sleep debt. Um, I, and, and I want you to continue your story, but I, I do want to insert, uh, I definitely remember you, remember you uh, from Comic Book Idol as uh, the duck guy. The duck guy. Yeah, that was me, the duck guy. So the duck thing was a very interesting thing. And so I'll, I'll tell you that story. And it's a, it's a weird story, but basically how the, so the audience catches up the way yep. it's structured, it's like a mimicked American Idol, but it's on a forum and not a TV show, right? And so each each week you advanced on, you'd have like an Invincible Pages and Ryan Otley was going to be the judge. Uh, C.B. Sabolsky had like his personal stories that he told that you had to illustrate. He was now the Marvel editor-in-chief and he was the guest judge. And so I started it. I think I got to the fifth round. I think I came in fifth out of the 10, if I remember correctly. But the one that got me voted off was the duck pages on the Invincible script. And so what happened with that was, and this is how I've always worked. And it, it's probably why me and Hickman started working Marvel style. But what happened was we got a script and in it, Invincible is flying and it says having a good time. And then as he sees something on the ground, he flies to something on the ground to save the day. And for me, I thought, what's having a good time? Oh, he would be messing with some ducks. And then I thought, oh, this is a genius thing. You have to show someone in midair without anything as a reference point to show speed and then stop. So if I have the ducks in the air, you have speed and then the duck hits the back of them. So now I've got a little sight gag. I've done exactly what the reader, I've got exactly what the, the writer wanted me to show for the reader to understand it. And then at the end, when Invincible goes down and saves the day, so this duck is, you know, exploded in the air. That when Invincible is down and saving the day, um, he saves the day. And then it, it, the script had ended with like him holding a bad guy or something. But then I had him put his foot out and catch a duck, the duck that had, was fallen, like duck hunt, right? And so I, I'm thinking, nailed it. This is the best. This is, this is how I work. You know, this is great. Turn it in and everybody's like, where did this duck come from? Why is there a duck in these pages? And I was like, I don't know why, uh, I guess, why, why not a duck? You know, like I'm doing what visually what I'm supposed to be doing to make the reader understand what I meant. And so uh, sure enough, I got voted off, but I felt really good because I put so much into trying to do three pages a week after only doing like three pages every five months, you know, yeah. and then I was, it was killing me. And so I was like, man, I felt really good when I got voted off. I was like, done everything I can. It was the happiest I'd ever been. I felt as, as disappointed as I thought I was going to be, you know, uh, I was like, man, I feel good about myself. And so that same day I go, go back home 
and uh, got an email from Marvel and I had never submitted to Marvel. And it was, um, they said, Hey Nick, we got a Mojo world story and we'd love to have you work on it. And I said, what? Like, I, like I'm going to work at Marvel. And then I mm-hmm. said, and I was like, this is amazing. So I, I asked him, I was like, how'd you hear about me? And they said, this new writer named Jonathan Hickman, uh, he saw your stuff online and he wanted to work with you. And there's a couple of amazing things about that. One, I had to, I asked him for his number and I called him and I said, man, thank you, man. You changed my life. He's like, dude, awesome. I love your stuff. You're doing that Seth Fisher thing. And Seth Fisher had recently passed away, another fantastic artist. And he was a huge influence on me. And he's like, I love Seth Fisher stuff too. And we're going to do some cool cool books together. And I was like, that's amazing. But I didn't know who Hickman was. So I went to the comic book store and I bought the nightly news. And I don't know if you've ever read the nightly news, but like, yeah. Yeah. So the, the main character, right. Yeah. He drew it. He drew it. So like, but so I was like, I'm going to just see what he draws like, but like uh, I always say with the nightly news is main characters up a pie chart because it's all like infographics. You know what I mean? He loves infographics. Yeah. He he loves a good eye for design. He really does. Oh, he's fantastic. He's fantastic. Um, so then we worked together. That's how I got my break. I got my break because I lost that competition. I just kept putting right. myself out there and falling on my face. So I'm still your fifth best, uh, I'm still your fifth best artist, guys. I like I, I, I like the duck stuff. I thought that it implied a sense of motion and depth that you don't always get by just drawing a guy in a flying pose. Like, yeah, you don't know how high or what speed without some sort of other object to to to. Dude, that, set that's the scene. A, so that's I thought exactly, that was a good idea, but yeah, it that's was exactly, interesting seeing those that was readers <laughs> react to that, like going like, huh? Wait, why didn't anybody else put the ducks in? Yeah, no, that's exactly, that's ex- you get it exactly. That's exactly what I meant for it to be. And it, uh, I guess I don't take comics so seriously in that way. You know, I just like, right. uh, just kind of get the, like, just kind of figure it out and have fun with your own storytelling. But I think that undermines other people's script sometimes, you know, so I get it. And- but I would also argue that a lot of writers will look for some a collaborator like that that can add some personality or character to their work that they don't need to have their hand held for every single panel. I think a lot of writers would appreciate that. Obviously, that worked out because you got work from it. Um, it is interesting that you mentioned Seth Fisher because I actually literally had that as a uh, as a note here in my like sort of questions. Um, tragically died really young that was like 2006 or something so it doesn't have a lot of work but was like that a similar very open line art style like i i look at your work there's not necessarily lots of um deep shadows or shading and stuff it's it's very open like um i don't know maybe a jeff darrow or a mobius but certainly seth fisher was somebody on my mind that was an influence for you at the time hugely influential the way he was mechanical I actually have a page here can i hold it up without messing up our yeah, do it. um let me see i i was showing off some of the work the other day and uh here's a page from uh, batman snow that he did and uh, it's got a it'll have a bad reflection but you can see it's uh, me. it's <laughs> 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 but it's the cover to batman snow uh which i which i really love and yeah. uh so like it's, and then it's there's very something- like uniform line art style, which I, I noticed some of your early work had um, a lot less like line variation, but like that some of your modern work, you, you have sort of changed that up a little bit like your, your work. You know, what, what, what other um, more recent like what was the progression of, of the- sort of developing your own style? Like, was it finding out how you drew or was it like that you found other influences, some mix like, you know, what kind of things think, adjusted and changed your style? That's a great question. Um, I think the main thing was I didn't draw like Jim Lee or Adam Kubert or Andy Kubert. I, I feel like those guys are romanticized. They're like when their Batman is angry, he puts his leg up with the Captain Morgan pose and Batman's angry. And it's almost like all, it almost was always the same or something like that. You know, there's like a, it feels like I'm not in the moment. But then when I found Quiet Lee's work, uh, on the authority, it was like when his Batman was angry or his was the Midnighter and he was angry, he would slowly turn his head. And then I'd be like, oh, that guy's angry. And then I'd turn the page and be following it along. But I couldn't draw that well. Um, and I and I, I don't, I still don't draw that well. So then when I found Seth Fisher, he was almost like a bridge to that style because he's more mechanical, almost Lego-y. Like he's not Lego-y, but he's more pared down, if that makes sense. The cartooning is a little more simplified. Whereas quietly is way more nuanced. So 
he was like a bridge for me to get into it. And then obviously with anytime you mention any of those guys, they're on the Mobius tree. So I, I, I found Mobius and I found Darrow quietly and Seth Fisher. Those were my four guys, but Seth Fisher was my I just got like, Oh, okay. I got three of the four. I, I, want, <laughs> yeah. I want credit for 75% on that one. <laughs> yeah. I wear my influence as close to my sleeve, but that's honestly like, I understand I'm a very t- a technical artist too. Like I understand yeah. perspective pretty well. So it's like, I'm using that to help me. And it's, uh, I always say I'm playing with my action figures again, because uh, at 12 or 13, I didn't want to lose my action figures. I was like, I got to give these up, but I loved getting them. You know, I love the exo squad and little GI Joes and exo suits. I was like, this is the coolest. And it was right when I wasn't allowed to have them anymore. Luckily I had a couple of younger brothers that I, that I can use their toys. But, but what I, what I realized what I'm doing as an adult is I'm just playing with my action figures again, but I'm taking them out of the 3d space, putting them into the 2d space. The fact that there's a skill set involved gives it gives me a pass, but I'm just playing with my toys again. I mean, you're the director and the cinematographer in like movie terms, uh, but that's I think what 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 we do as kids. Yeah, we like pose them, we make like yeah. commas and stuff like that, and then as an adult, like you know, if we're drawing, we're just trying to add the idea of like motion and character and stuff like that. But um, that is absolutely. Um, let me think. Um, what about your work process? You know, like you, you, you learned from like your friend that was like going to school, you took some art education classes. What would you say is like, has your work uh, environment and your work style, like your way of working, has that always been about the same? You know, do you just sit down and do the work or do you have a process for getting ready and doing certain amount of preparation for uh, tackling a page? You know, like- My- a lot of thumbnails, yeah. blue pencils, like light leads. What? Like, tell us, talk to us. About it used process. to be, it used to be always roughs with marker. So I, so I couldn't get too detailed and I had like really nice uh, light boxes that I would use all the time. And I would just, I would used to take naps on them because they would hum, you know, I would lay down and they were the thicker ones, you know? And so I would, uh, I would work like that all the time markers and I could do the marker roughs quick build the form out and not care about the detail, just care about the structure and the silhouettes and shapes. And then I would light box it multiple times to get it super tight. So from then, uh, recently with the iPad pro, um, you can do those kind of sketches in SketchUp or not SketchUp. Um, I forget the sketch and program procreate. So you do the sketch and procreate. So I do the sketches and procreate now and then print them out blue line. But it used to all be blue pencil, all be like drafting supplies. I used to, there was a drafting supply store in Houston because I, uh, most of this, most of my art journey, I was at home with my parents and uh, I would go to this drafting supply store and I would buy the light boxes and the blue pencils and the rulers and all that stuff. So it was all, I always treated it like I was a, like a drafter or something and I was going to do these technical drawings. But now it's been more relaxed. Now I can sit in my chair with the iPad Pro and draw, draw and procreate. I have a really nice printer that prints them out 11 by 17 uh, on Axel or John. I I've always changed my process. I always change my inking. I used to use dip pens uh, on Axel or John. I was going to knock everything out and just go microns. Cause I can con- control it completely. Um, make sure the details all the way. So for every panel on Axel or John, it's on its own page. So I'm printing every panel 11 by 17 and it's all widescreen. So I've, I've just gone out of my way to like clean up my process because my process has always been a little bit chaotic and I do a panel a day now. So what I do is I print out an 11 by 17 panel and I ink it every day. That's okay. what I've been doing. So, and that's, you know, a hundred pages later, here we are. Yeah, no, that is interesting. Um, I'm, I'm looking sort of behind you. And one thing that I find interesting is like, you know, we, we obviously know a lot of your influences for art are very, um, clean open line art style and yet you've got a frank frazetta poster up there like who's like you know one of the kings of like well-rendered detail and stuff what's the um what's the artwork that's over your left shoulder oh over the left shoulder back there that is a that's a james jean piece um oh wow beautiful yeah it's a i don't know if you can see it or not but it's a it's a preliminary sketch um and so uh he did these beautiful paintings that they turned into statues one is of the ninja turtles and one is of the bad guys. And I love Bebop from Bebop and Rocksteady, uh, Bebop and Rocksteady from the Turtles. I yeah. actually have about 50 commissions of that character. And, and you got to I, do an issue of them too. I did. I did. I actually, yeah. like uh, I said, I told, they had reached out for another 
project at EW. And I said, just here's the deal. If y'all ever get Bebop, just let me work on Bebop. All right. And that's how I ended up getting that gig. So, uh, but, but then I, I saw James Jean had done the, the painting and I know that he always does a really nice pencil uh, version of his paintings before he paints them. So I was like, I wonder if it exists. And then my rep Felix, um, ended up repping James Jean to represent not his paintings, but his comic book work. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you better keep an eye out for that. You like, you better That's keep right. an eye out. If that prelim ever comes in and uh, sure enough, it came through and uh, I was able to get it. So, and, and then right behind your head, is that the original like Mark Bagley work of Venom? <laughs> this is my favorite forgery piece ever. Oh, um, somebody, it's a recreation some, or something. It's a recreation, but it's a, it's a high end recreation. Like they didn't just print out the thing. They what they did was they they have it all stapled and smeared glue on it and uh, and uh, like the acetates on it. It's like it looks like the most real thing ever. And I've been waiting like and people people know me because I I have an art collection I, I like to show off online, but that's like a big fake. And I, I want to give it away to like a buddy and let them blow their mind and let them think they have a piece. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, that's the, very the cruel, uh, Nick. That's that's a, that's a terrible prank. But if you do it, you better record it. <laughs> You better get that recorded and then just like uh, let them know what they actually have. <laughs> Tell me about a time you've been at this point, like a professional for quite a while. And bef before that, like a fan. So uh, tell me about an awkward convention story. Give us, give, what do you have for that? <laughs> I got a few. Uh, Good. I'm, I got a few. There's a couple. I mean, you want me to tell the Avers flower story, but keep it PG or no? Is that if you can dangerous? keep it PG, that is a good story. Actually. I know the one you're talking about. I'll keep it PG. Um, All so right. back when I was an immature man, um, I had a, I was in this huge deadline crunch and it was 2015 and I was just dating a new girl and uh, I knew I couldn't see her and I hadn't been able to see her for a while because this deadline crunch was killing me. And I was like, I'm going to tell her I'm not a flower guy. I'm not a Valentine's guy. It ain't happening. Uh, but I was going to send her a bunch of flowers on Valentine's Day. So this company um, was going. It was, it was supposed to come the day before. So I call her and she didn't say thanks for the flowers or anything, which was weird. So I was like, okay, well that didn't work. So I try to call this company that was supposed to send the flowers and they didn't send them. And I was on hold for like two, an hour and a half drop call, hour and a half drop call, hour and a half drop call, and I'm in this deadline crunch. Like, what is going on? The next morning on Valentine's Day, officially. I'm like, I'm going to call them. I'm sure they're going to come in today, but I just want to make sure she's going to get them. And uh, I get on the phone with them and they're completely unhelpful. And they're like, actually, they're not going to come for about seven more days. And I was like, dude, I've already told, <laughs> I've already told this girl that I've already been a jerk, you know? And so like, I just went very immaturely went ballistic online and uh, started drawing this flower pot man who was like mean and chasing me around and ruining my day basically. And, uh, and it got a lot of coverage and, you know, bleeding. That is a cover very, <laughs> very PG way of describing it. And I appreciate that. Let's keep yeah. it like that. People can keep look it, like it up that. if they want more detail, but yes. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, and eventually the, the flower, I got so much traction for it. The lawyers for the flower company started reaching out to me, you know, and they were like, you better stop this. And I, I was even tweeting out what they were sending me. I was like, whatever, I don't care. Um, I was furious. And so, um, yeah, I kind of gave them an ultimatum too. I, I never like swung like, hey, I'm an artist. I'll ruin your day. But I was like, here's the deal, guys. You can't get them in seven days. If I call a local florist and I beat you, if I can find someone on Valentine's Day to get her those flowers today, you can call me up. You can call and find them too. You can help me. Uh, and just call me back. And they didn't call me back. And I did find a florist and I tipped them well and they got them there. So then I'd won. And I said, if I do this, then I'm going to ruin y'all's day. And I, I went out of my way to ruin their day. I probably ruined my career for a while too, but, but you know, so anyway, um, what happened was uh, uh, at a show one day, I, I thought it was nothing, you know, no big deal. It kind of blew over. But then I started getting commission requests for the, the flower pot man that terrorized me. I started getting his commission requests from fans all the time, which I thought was fun. Uh, and the, the more, the fun part of the story is um, even though I was a monster and a, you know, showed my ass a little bit. The, uh, the girl that I got sent those flowers to were married and two kids now in a house. So whatever I did must've charmed her. You know it what worked. I mean? It worked. <laughs> it, it worked. But you it did, worked. you're saying that at the convention, you'd have people come up and ask for still to this day. No. I've had the, the first time it happened, I was, that was like, what, what are you talking about? And then it all came back. 
but I've had people, I've had people try to buy the, uh, the original sketches of that, of that bad day. It was a bad day when I was an immature man. So we'll leave it at that. Yeah. 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 I, I, I can't oh. call you like the hero of that piece, <laughs> but I, I'm glad that, uh, that there are still fans that, uh, that like to, to bring that up to you. That's fine. But, but speak, speaking to our intro, and this is a really awkward one. It's, uh, oh, yeah. The, yeah. So Patera and Dragata sound a little bit alike, both like Italian sounding last names, but our careers are a little bit uh, similar in that we both work with Aikman. And uh, our books were both out at the same time, East to West and Manhattan projects. And we would do shows and signings around the same time through our rep. And I would be sitting there and I'd be so happy because they'd be like, oh, I love your stuff. It's so good. Thank you so much. And they're digging through it. Oh, thanks so much, man. Uh, that's so cool, you know? And then you, uh, I, I have extra prints. I always give away free prints if people know who I am. It makes me so excited. And Or they'll be reaching in their bag and pull it out. And sure enough, they pull out East of West by Nick Dragata. And I'm like, man, we're already in this conversation. Oh. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not Nick, I'm not Nick Dragata. Like, what do we do now? You know what I mean? Uh, or they get the print that's not, that's not, east and west and they they start realizing it before you do and that's happened like four or five times <laughs> okay so i'm not the first one to uh find those similarities interesting yeah, yeah. interesting well yeah i'm not the most original guy um let me ask this who would you say has helped you get to where you are now and then after that have you used your position to help anyone else do you think Oh man, I'd say I, I try to as much as possible. I think the best thing I've done in comics as far as helping other people was Felix Comic Art is a really big rep who's really changing the game for modern collectors. We got James Heron, Trad Moore, Chris Burnham, Stegman, James Jean, Paul Pope. We had some murderers row. Um, he's a really sharp businessman, but it took one guy to go first. I and so I meet like Felix was a guy who just collected art but I loved his vision for what collecting art was. So I went first and I said, okay, he rep me. Then I got Dragata, who was a buddy to come on and Riley Rossmo to come on. And what I would do is I would say, all you guys draw better than me, but I make more money than you. Why don't you come over? And I started winning them over. So the base of that grew and all those guys make good money now, but it took one person to jump and do that. And I, I don't think I helped out. It's all Felix's work. And I'm just, you know, ridiculous sometimes with the, my decision-making, but that helped out. And th there's a kid, uh, his name's Ken. Um, he comes to me in the summers a lot and hangs out. He wanted to go to the Kubert school. He's about 25 years old. Um, I met him when he was 20 and uh, he'll come to my studio and hang out and uh, we'll, we'll draw and I'll overdraw him and we'll work. And uh, he won the Kubert school scholarship three years in a row and just graduated. So I think he's going to be something. Uh, so I uh, helped, helped out Hickman has absolutely helped me out. Like that was a big one. Uh, but I got to give credit where credit's due. Like, and I don't even, I mean, I know quietly. Okay. But, but quietly's work and Jeff Darrow's work and Seth Fisher's work, like, uh, through their work, they've been my teachers, you know, like I study them. I learn perspective from them. I learn storytelling and timing and pacing. I give all credit. Like Frank Wiley is a true master. Your recent uh, episode was fantastic. And um, you can learn everything from him. Like you said, like when you started hitting the different things, it's lighting, it's, it's figure work, it's, it's expressions, it's timing. And um, those guys guide you and quietly doesn't have a lot of advice. He says, always do your best work. And if you always do your best work and you're, you're always be beating yourself from the day before, who's the only person you can beat when you draw. If yeah. you compare yourself to James Heron, you're done. You're finished. You, you'll, you'll never... You'll never advance. But if you compare yourself to your last bad drawing and never be satisfied, and so quietly has a saying where he's, he's never been satisfied with a piece, which is insane, you know, he's so good. But, but you do that long enough and you start separating yourself from the pack. So um, his work and his dedication when he had small gigs and was still willing to paint them, still willing to pull all nighters or whatever he was doing, that was a guiding light for me because I, I didn't come from a family of illustrators. I didn't have a lot of schooling when it came to to art and so uh i can never thank uh vin enough i mean he's super cool super cool dude yeah yeah i i i've been wanting to do an episode about his work for a long time um 
doesn't always seem to be everybody's cup of tea, but I just wanted to at least argue my case. I, I feel like he's masterful. I sincerely do. So it's fun to have that. Did you, uh, did you, did you get him. to write him back? Did you get to write him back? You know, oh, this yeah, is I, talk, I talked a little bit to him. Oh, good, good. Dude, write him back, dude. He's a sweet man. He's I didn't so get everything a hundred percent right in my video. Um, there, there was one mistake I made, which was just me. Um, this is, this shows you how your own memories can't always be trusted. Um, I remembered uh, his X-Men run and the giant Sentinel destroying Genosha. In my mind, that was a direct response that he and Morrison had done because of 9-11. No, that came out like in May of, of 2001. That came out months before. Uh, so I did get that wrong because I said that it was in response. And that, 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 that totally drives me nuts because I was 100% convinced I was remembering something right and I didn't fact check myself. So hopefully he doesn't hold that against me because I did. No, he, he, he's a, he's the nicest guy, man. Yeah. He's, he's the nicest guy. If you ever, have you ever got to meet him at a show or anything? No, no, I'd love to, I'd love to, but no, 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 no such luck for me. I was happy to be the middleman for one email. That made me feel good. Very it kind made, of you. Made, yes, it made I me proud. It. It, it, it was nice. He did help fact check me on a few things that I got. So that, that was nice. Um, let's talk about this. My segues today are just flawless. I just go to, to a question. I don't have like too, too much in the way of a segue today. Um, tell us, because I think so many viewers here at least love drawing or love knowing about the process. Tell us about a really tough deadline that you faced and, um, and maybe how you like either handled it or weren't able to handle it or something. Like to tell us a, a, a challenge like that, if you're willing to share. Sure. Uh, I, I'd say the toughest one, there's been two tough ones, but the, the, the toughest by far was uh, when I was working on Leviathan with John Lehman, we were already behind schedule and I was doing the thing where I'm going to get three pages done in a couple of days and make everyone happy. And everyone on the team was late on the creative side. It was uh, Mike Garland was behind on colors and I was behind and, you know, Stevenson had said, Hey, where's the book at? You know, we got that email. And then we had just had a newborn baby too. So I was exhausted and you know, we were like nine days into having a newborn and when that happened, um, like my, my wife, who I consider a hypochondriac, you know, uh, she said, you know, the, the baby's not eating, you know, she's not eating. And I was like, it was only for a meal or like an hour or two, you know, but they eat all the time. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, we'll go up to the hospital. Although I don't really have time for this right now. Well, we ended up not leaving that hospital for over two months. She, uh, when she wasn't eating, they couldn't figure out what was wrong. Her bowel stopped moving. Uh, we ended up, uh, you know, having to have stomach surgery on her and it became a big deal. She had to recover for months. So it was this big thing. And in the middle of that uh, image that wrote me, they were like, hey, where's the book? Where's the book? And I didn't have time to respond to them. I just said, hey, guys, I'm in the hospital right now. I'm not going to be able to turn this book in. So they marked Leviathan as canceled. And we're still mm -hmm. planning on getting back to it. But that was the, by, it was almost not stressful because I was so worried about my kid that I did not care about comic books at the time. It was the least of my concerns, you know? I understand so, that. Yeah. So, but, but it was also like, um, it was the, the stress of like having to switch from hiding in my room to being a dad or what I was a new dad, you know, I still am kind of a new dad, but like trying to get that work balance is always, is, is really nuts, really tough. And that was like a very hard lesson in that I was just not paying attention to the kids and, uh, or my one kid at the time we have two now. But, uh, but then my wife's instincts for her was, was strong, you know, and so I'm glad we went when we went, I'm glad she's, you know, better now, but it was a tough, it was a tough road. And then she had to recover after we got out of the hospital too, for a number of months and have some reconstructive surgeries and stuff. So like for when that happened, you know, obviously Leviathan with Layman isn't finished yet, but we're, we have plans to finish it. Um, the, the summer I've talked to Stevenson about that and stuff, but that was a really tough um, deadline crunch. There was another, there was a couple other ones too, that were just, uh, you know, small things here and there, but w what happens with comic art, I find is it becomes a lifestyle. Like you're, you're here all the time. There's no, you're working at night, you're working during the day. So like everything, when a deadline comes up, starts going over, you're not taking the trash out. You're not, you're not taking care of the stuff you need to. So that work-life balance is still something I, uh, is tough for me today. My, my, my girl's waking up at seven o'clock in the morning, oddly makes you a little more timely. You know what I mean? You, you have to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Now I appreciate you sharing that. I bet that like uh, the work-life balance is tough for a lot of people that do anything working from home, which is probably a lot more people these days than just comic book people. So I'm sure a lot of people can relate uh, figuring out that balance. Um, tell us all 
what we should do if we're interested in axe wielder John, like where should we uh, look to get more information on this crowdfunding project? Um, well, uh, axe wielder John will be hosted on Zoop. I bought the URL axewielder.com. So you can just type axewielder.com. It'll take you right to the page. Um, it's, uh, it's a 148 page oversized hardcover. It's made just the way I want. It's my passion project. Uh, if you listen to the beginning of this interview, you know all about it now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for fans to check it out. Uh, I hope they support it. When's um, the campaign from just, just, uh, like later. Oh, we're, we're going to run it from, uh, we've talked to Zoop about it. We, we launch on, uh, April 26th and it's going to run maybe to June 6th. June 6th is my 40th birthday and that's exactly 40 days. So like 40 days to 40, maybe. Okay. I don't know if I want to, I want to announce that I'm turning an old man, you know, but uh, it'd well, be, you just did. I, I just did. Well, I just did. So so I think we're going to do like 40 days to 40 or do 30 days and extend it 10 days, maybe extend it. But I think just 40 days to 40 is a good little mini campaign yeah. there. So I think we're going to do that and then uh, it'll be finished. So I can say I had it done by 40. So the line art will be done and then we're going to, we got uh, colors coming in fast and we're putting, putting the book together. So it's That's almost exciting. complete and uh, we got distribution lined up. We got Zoop support and uh, we're ready to roll. So I'm super excited. Are you thinking at all yet about the next project? Is that, or is that like in the back of your oh, head or not yeah. yet? Oh yeah. Yeah. The book is planned. The next, uh, I, I got to do an aside and finish the fifth issue of Leviathan. That's what I have left to draw. Okay. And then, then uh, I've already paid for the painted covers by this master painter, Das Pastoras for the next two volumes. So every year I had this, I had this idea where like, I wish Art Adams, I love Art Adams. He's one of my favorites, but I wish he would just always do like one comic a year instead of 20 covers a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, I I feel that way about guys like Adam Hughes and uh, yeah. Dave Johnson. I mean, they're uh, Tony Moore. There are a lot of guys. They're just brilliant at covers, but also brilliant at sequential art. And I would love to see more. So I totally yeah. get that with Art Adams. Absolutely. Yeah. So then with my stuff, I was like, if I draw, you know, this 33 by 17 uh, size, like it's going to take me forever. But if I'd stop doing commissions and I stop doing cover work and all that stuff, like I can just do like one great book a year. So like, I really want to do Axwood or John volumes one a year uh, and make it a property, you know? And so I've, I've actually plotted out, I plotted out five books, but that seems so daunting to me having finished one and it taking so long. So uh, my, we, the, the, we, I got the painted covers for the next two and uh, the story uh, the first big story will be complete uh, at the end of the third volume. So he's, we got lots of adventures planned with him. I, I plan on doing a lot with him. Yeah. Um, well, for what it's worth, uh, I sincerely liked what I read. I'm looking forward to seeing the complete version. Um, not just saying that. Uh, turned down lots of interview requests and stuff like that. Um, but Nick, I thought you had an interesting project and had some interesting uh, advice. And I, I sincerely appreciate you giving some of your time here with us today. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's the hardest thing to do so far is asking for these type of interviews. Your channel is, I, and I, I mean, it's the bottom of my heart. It's my favorite channel. The work you put in is incredible. Your intros are hilarious. The fact that you're yourself and that's getting over with the fans is, isn't a surprise. Um, it's just cool to see your success and I'm honored and so grateful that a channel of, of your knowledge of your exposure would have me on it's I'm, I know I'm not worthy of it. I know you did this as a favor to me. So I sincerely appreciate it. That's not true. Oh, hi. You caught me getting my ego stroked. Speaking mm -hmm. about ego, let's talk about Darwin Cook's ego. And this was just all like an hour interview. <laughs> it was all just designed to be an opening for one of my silly episodes, right? <laughs> that was all yeah. just set up. <laughs> no, no. I appreciate the kind words. It was it was not just a favor, Nick. Uh, I, I, I did it because I think that this is a project worthy of talking about. And I knew that you had some interesting um, stories to share. And I appreciate you being open and honest with, uh, with my viewers. I hope that they'll all uh, give some serious consideration to going to uh, Zoop or AxeWielder.com uh, on April 26th. And um, I just hope that you uh, and your family are doing well. And thank you so much for your time. Man, thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate you. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. 
If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.